here with Michael St. Clair, and he's written a wonderful new book called Zen of the Stars. Tell me about your book. Well, the book is a product of about 10, 12 years of research. Initially, there were four books, 15, 1600 pages. I cut them all down over the years and summarized it, condensed it. The book deals with the origin of mankind, our cosmology, where I think we came from, our most probable futures on this planet, and it deals with many aspects of how we're going to go through the next 40, 50 years. So Zen of Stars is the story basically of a time portal and of the master of the light who is a sort of a light being and we're here in the castle, Shion Castle by the Lake of Geneva, which is where the novel, the book, actually begins and ends in several dimensions. On the granite needle, we're sitting on a 1,400 meter granite needle that comes out of the Lake of Geneva. Vortex. We're actually sitting inside of the vortex. Fabulous. It's now near sun, so we have a very quiet energy. We can maybe feel it, although we're working here. This is a place that probably was settled in human history by the Celts in about 6700 BC. Sorry, 6700 of our time. I mean, about 1400 years ago. Okay. But the other reality is more likely that this place had existed on top of the granite le needle for maybe as much as four or five thousand years. We just don't know. The traces are very old. The formal history begins around the 11th, 12th century. So as far as linear mind is concerned, this is a Templar castle. This is a typical Templar place with art by the Italian and English masters from the 12th and 13th century. It was then rebuilt and built over it many, many times up to the 17th century when pretty much the French handed it over to the Swiss. And Chillon Castle became very well known through Lord Byron because he came here. I think friends of his started working on the novel Frankenstein and he wrote the famous poem or little story called The Prisoner of Chillon. That's why the place actually got known. What made you leave the contemporary world um, in the everyday sense and become something of an occult master, uh, you know, for lack of a better term. Yes, I see what you mean. I really was that since I was a kid. As, as funny as it sounds, ever since I can remember six, seven years of age, when I was actually here for the first time that I can really remember, I knew what was going on in what I call the elven world, that other world that I describe in the book. And you talk about <coughs> the earth changes is that right yes. in your book? Yes. And you, something of your contacts and then what you're talking about in terms of um, what else? A certain psychic intuition about when they might occur? Yes, okay. I use the term earth changes because that's the word everyone has agreed to call it. But I say first of all, you know what's happening outside in the real reality is going to be less important. Let's, let me make this really clear. In my book it's very clear. What is the, the 3D, the physical world politics, society, economics, uh, quakes, weather changes, all that. That's what I call the outside world. That is less important than the inside world. What I talk about more in my book is about what we from inside ought to be doing about what's going to happen outside. But I say we shouldn't react to the outside event. We should from inside, at least one shouldn't say should, but we want to be able from inside to grow into this and be ready to meet it sort of head on without any fear because there's nothing to fear it's going to be actually fun in my opinion anyway it's going to be very interesting we're going to meet a whole new science the awakening of a new geometry of new mathematics so there is exciting stuff that is going to happen that is so much more interesting than you know what does it matter there will be quakes uh, tsunamis there will be certain years when there are climactic changes a slight changing of the poles, probably, changes of the Gulf Stream, and so on. Those are the physical changes. I estimate they are somewhere between 2009 and 2020, more or less, that decade. 
you can't really peg it to one event. There are going to be several events. I think one in 2009, another one in 2011. I said in my book, I can repeat it quickly, that there's a young boy in Russia called Boriska. He's known as the little boy from Mars. And he says that in 2009 and 2011, according to his memory from Mars, as strange as it sounds, he remembers very well his life and the pre-recorded ID or message he has. And this is a small kid, seven years old, that talks in Moscow, in the area uh, around Moscow. Never mind, he, he also says 2009, 2011 are key years, numbers that he remembers. But he's not sure of what it is in the physical world, whether it's a quake or what nature the event is. But he speaks of a rather large calamity for one continent. Mm -hmm. Again, like I said, I don't think the physical events, the outside world, is what we should focus on. I want people more to focus within because we are the change and the change comes from within. So if, say, a handful of people worldwide really live with this change inside... It's and true that um, Krishnamurti has been quite an influence on you. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yes. Yes, you could not be not influenced after reading Krishnamurti. I read many of his works for a number of years because I wanted to create a different kind of astrology. I wanted to explain it to people in such a way that they could use it and live with it. Astrology has been for far too long made ununderstandable so that people could not approach it. And Krishnamurti basically always said, don't build structures, don't build theories, and in essence, he said, free yourself from the known. And he said, do not structure truths. You cannot. The truth is not known. It's, it's always new. You have to live it. And so I tried to apply what he was trying to teach people over 50, 60 years into what I'm explaining to people that's going to happen over the next, say, 20, 40 years. My book goes well into 2050, even 2080. And Krishnamurti, for me, has been an influence in as far as I had to face also myself. I had to go into, why am I here? What am I doing? What's the message going to be? How will I explain this to people? So in that respect, I owe him a lot because he was a great teacher in the methodology. He had a way of showing people the way to themselves, but he had no method. So working towards what, what, what you might term the merging of the dimensions? Yes. Where there being... There's sort of it's be, you're being able to see through the different dimensions and connecting them. Yes. Um, all people are having this this sort of transition happen. Yes, this is coming now more and more. It began a few years ago. I don't know what it has to do with the scientists I talk to. We we're not so sure. What we know when we have great stillness, like we have here, a moment where things come together. We feel one can that there is a sort of a merging of light and everything is after all light.